Tripp and I talk about the over-reliance on data, the inability for marketing leaders to set or maintain sufficient budgets, and the problems of being risk-adverse in a crowded marketplace. They say marketing is a madman's game. So now we turn it over to the Marketing Madman with Nick Constantino and Trip Job. Happy Saturday. Welcome to the Marketing Madman. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here live from the Battery. And, uh, you know... We're most of the way through the year now. Um, we've Certainly feels of, that way, yeah, huh? It goes from January to July real fast. Yeah, and, you know, I think uh, we've been able to see that, uh, you know, what the heck is going on, you know, with uh, with marketing out there? I mean, I, obviously there's always good things going on, but um, it seems like every week now we're turning around and just seeing um, stories of, uh, well, first off, uh, Twitter gets rebranded in X. Yeah, because they felt the pressure for the first time ever. And what does Musk do? Knee jerks to a complete <laughs> brand change. Like everything you're told not to do in marketing, yeah. he does in one fell swoop. Right. It right. Oh, yeah, just kind of stay the course. Don't let the competitors throw you off. One competitor comes out of nowhere and boom. Mm-hmm. And of course, talking about threads by Facebook, but boom, rebrands the entire thing, throws we, all the equity in the garbage. Um, yeah, that's a good example of it for yeah. sure. But uh, that's, that's one of many things that's been going on. And uh, I know you're. Uh, you, you see a lot of it in your daily uh, interactions with companies and how they're thinking about things. And, um, you know, I see stuff out on social media and others where people start quoting uh, numbers and metrics. And I'm going, do they even know what they're talking yeah. about? Yeah. I'm going to try to keep my uh, my job and what I see out of this because otherwise I'm going to get angry, <laughs> start screaming, and my hand gestures are going to get more violent. So we're, I'm going to try to cover this from, from a 30,000-foot view. But just look – you're in a hard marketing year. One, we were expecting this recession that still has not come. We have all this pent up demand from COVID that some people are spending now. Some people can't catch up to the numbers they were hitting, uh, all these different industries. And I think mo- like most things, there's a news cycle for marketing and media now. There's ad week, there's all these people that are covering this, which makes it spin even more violently out of control. So uh, I think we're gonna dub this episode, What's Wrong With Marketing in 2023? Um, we ran some LinkedIn polls, we had some conversations. A lot of this will be anecdotal, but you do have some pretty good numbers, um, and we got some pretty good ideas. So, yeah. So, what did the people say? Let's. Uh, I know we asked kind of uh, what they thought. Well, why don't you take them down uh, the list of choices that sure. we had and uh, where people came out? Sure. Again, this is not exactly the most scientific poll the world has ever seen, but um, LinkedIn only allows you to put so many out there. So we put some and we see what people are saying. So the first one, um, and this is one that hits home, and I think this is really starting to now manifest itself, is an over-reliance or misuse of data, metrics, and analytics. Okay? And Good question. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and realistically, all we're saying there is we have become so data heavy that we are losing our instinct and our knack and our creativity is what made marketing great to begin with. Uh, the second one, an inability to set and or maintain sufficient budgets. This is one that I'm hearing a lot, that, that if you are not given the leeway to create and implement and keep your budget, how is it possible for you to set your achieve your goals as a marketer? I'm mm-hmm. sure this is a story that has been long throughout your career. CMOs hang their necks by this one. This yeah. is the one that is ultimately um, too focused on new leads as opposed to conversion rate, retention, or lifetime value. That's one we deal with all the time. I mean, if you're so worried about customer acquisition, what happens to the, you, you, are you retaining these customers? Right. Is a customer that's gonna spend $100,000 over the lifetime the same value as someone that's gonna spend $1,000? Um, too risk averse. Another one, whenever you head into times of economic uncertainty, the first thing pulled out is risk. And one thing we know, the ultimate truth about business, about anything in life, the higher the risk, the higher the reward. Uh, and then the last one I thought, actually, let's do two more. A one size fits all approach of implementing the same techniques that you do in radio in pay per click or in social media or in PR. Um, and then finally, the last one, and this is one that's really just started to kind of resonate with me, but finding the right tools to use. I mean, between CRM, automation, AI, it feels like every week there's a new tool. And the problem is for every tool, there's another expense line also, which makes your marketing less effective. So those are the ones we threw out there. Um, I'm going to read the poll off right now and and see what actually garnered the most response. But I mean, you're talking, uh, uh, so right now, so, okay, this is with only a couple dozen responses, but number one right now is focus on leads over conversion. And I find that fascinating. Okay. Um, number two was inability to maintain budgets, and then the other one seemed pretty even. But okay. I think that. So I, let's start there. Let's, let's start, start there. with the, 
you know, focus on leads. And I think um, so the, the biggest thing to me is when I get in and I've seen marketing departments that their number one metric is uh, number of leads. I'm like, OK, it's all about them. It's not about the business. OK. All right. And so, you know, are they and, and more often than not, I would go, they're probably not very well connected to the sales department. OK. And I've seen but, but, it. Uh, you, you want but as salespeople, all salespeople want is leads. So you're I saying to the most tenured sellers, like the new sellers, the guys that want this, they always want I'm these leads. But. Not necessarily. I've walked into a number of cases where the sales team are so fed up because they all they get is junk leads. Uh, and that's okay. so okay. my point is Got it. I understand. if the focus is on the number of leads, all oh, marketing is only responsible for creating new leads. And that's where it's coming from the top. Maybe now the CMO doesn't even have that ability. It's look, I can go out and buy leads. I can right. buy junk leads. Right. I can buy right. I, I can just throw things out there, even if they're not junk, but they're in my my industry, leads that really don't have much chance of conversion. If if I'm not looking at how many become opportunities and eventually how many become clients, I love the lifetime value. A lot of companies aren't there. They don't know how to measure that. That's fine. Yeah. But understand what your typical rate. We had we had that discussion this morning. You know, how many how many prospects does it take to get demos? How many demos does sure. it end up taking to typically land a customer? Sure. And then now and you're marketing, talking cost and marketing's on that call. They, they now you're need talking to about cost per acquisition. That. You're yes, hundred percent. And and again, I think the big problem of what people do wrong is they don't look at this from the other side, right? How much are the bad leads costing you? Exactly. You've got to send salespeople. You have to have people answering the phones that are spending their time putting dealing things with bad in leads. Salesforce or whatever your CRM is. Yeah, and we all know from the sales side, there are always going to be salespeople who just love to use CRM. They're going to keep every note of every client they've ever had. That doesn't mean they're close in a damn thing. It just means yeah. they know how to use the system. So I, yeah, I, and, and I agree. I mean, look, I walked in, you know, once or twice, and I was like, God, this is a huge spike the year before in leads and the marketing team was a little worried um you know how how were they going to measure this year and be judged so they looked at um they had done a contest the year before so sure. guess what end of the year october they ran a sweepstakes how many of those leads panned into anything it yeah. was just to bump the lead number back yeah. up so year over year yeah and i would also uh, go one further depending on the business you're in but if someone's jumping into a sweepstakes to win some rinky dink little prize, they're probably not a good candidate to begin with because who does that? Like, when was the last time you're like, wow, I really need blah, blah, blah. Let me join this sweepstakes. Well, in, in this case, it was sweepstakes for, you know, backyard. I mean, it was the right thing. But the reality is, most of the people who entered would not spend their own money. Therefore, they weren't a real prospect. Yeah. Or maybe they were a prospect, but they weren't qualified. It, yes, it would be a dream backyard. But they never do it themselves. They didn't have the money, didn't want to have the money. But all of a sudden, 20,000 people put in if you're going to make right. it free. Right. So, yeah. you know, it's understanding that. And then, you know, not only is it, yeah, it spikes the numbers, but I don't want a spike. I want to, you know, yeah. something that's working throughout the year. What's my pipeline yep. look all year, yep. all year long? Yeah. And I think I see these on LinkedIn now. It's like, we'll give you 100 bucks to take a demo. And it's like, what? Whoa, whoa. Right. First of all, if I ever saw someone I know trying to do something like that, like you're just going to hand cash to somebody to do a demo of something that they're not even – and that's the problem. People think that these these social media platforms are so targeted. You know how many things I get for – that's not even in my realm of scope that I'm getting ads for. So, yeah, and I think it also is a matter of marketing. If you are only tracking leads with your marketing, you may have a full funnel, but are you getting the best clients? Are you betting the best consumers? Are you increasing your own value proposition? Because sometimes if you're running a $100 special, yeah, you're going to get tons of clients, but what is the perceived value? It's low because all you see is that $100. You know, so I, I think that – I think that this is going to become more and more of a problem. And I think that one of the things people are starting to realize is when you go to Google and you go to pay-per-click, what you're getting most of the times are bad leads that you have to put so much effort to following up with. And my only recommendation there, if you are on that kind of plan, follow the success of those leads. See how many it really takes to convert to a demo or, or, or a, a next call. Follow that path. Because I think you'll realize that yep. you may be spending fifteen dollars per click, but if only five of those clicks are working, then you might be spending more like three or four hundred dollars per click, which is not good part of the value equation. If you're an owner or a president or whatever, and this is you know, look, this may be your quarterly reviews, but have your sales and marketing leaders walk you through what that pipeline looks like. 
you know, again, I, I had we had a client a while back and, you know, we showed them that the time to convert on certain types of leads was astronomical. And th- there was a reason for it. Sure. The, the, the leads then um, had a low conversion and they're like, well, that's sales's problem. Yeah, and that's not, the, like, that's not the answer. No, no, you've got to bring them together. You have to understand you have, you know, in this case, it wasn't necessarily bad leads. The right. leads were not going to the right place. Right. These were different products. And you didn't know the, you didn't know the sales cycle. The a, lead, what does the lead have to do if the sales cycle is long? A, a short-term sales approach. A million approach? dollar um, capital equipment versus a $5,000 expense right. equipment. And that's really what it was. And they didn't understand that they're different and they need to be, um, you know, managed differently. Yeah, I think it's frustrating because it's it, now it's easier than ever to have make it easy for these departments to talk to each other yeah. with Slack and Teams and CRM and everyone should have access. I mean, this data is there. It's just are the leaders using it and speaking a coherent language to make to use them effectively? And I think that's going to be a theme with a lot of this stuff. Is just um, you know. It, it really is. It's not a function of the company that they're doing things wrong. It's a function of the departments that they're not speaking to each other. It's too you know, siloed. It's something we like that. We have someone from marketing on our weekly pipeline meeting. You know, there's it. it's typically the same person, but if not, someone else comes in. And it's to hear what's going on, to understand, take it back to their team. They don't all need to be there, but hear it and understand. And, and sure. this morning we were going through, hey, how can we, um, you know, take some opportunities across businesses and yeah. how do we work together and, and take those leads. So, yeah. um, no, that's fascinating. I think that's, um, I, I agree. That's probably the number one actionable item that uh, people need to think about how to fix. And, and again, so, I, I can't, I couldn't actually, I was actually a little surprised that it was so high. Yeah. I, I think it shows a good, a good understanding of problems because that's admitting you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Right, admitting you're doing something wrong, and some of the times these people are in denial about it. But that's admitting if you're too focused on leads, you are. Not, and again, sales staffs have shrunk; they've cut back on, they fired a lot oh, of people. Yeah. So that makes what you, the time that you do it with your employees that much more important. And that's probably the 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 C level is is trying to get. Hey, we need new business. So all right, well, we'll dig into uh, uh, the rest of the survey when we come back. And you've been listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra One Hundred Six Point Three. This morning in North Carolina, wheels are spinning. Determination is winning. A passion is now a thriving business, and it shows no signs of slowing down. How? The power of a conversation, like the one Clint Spiegel had with First Horizon Bank about starting a bike wheel manufacturing facility in Asheville. Now it's not just talk, it's rubber meets road. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here. And, uh, you know, we were just talking about leads and uh, not really understanding, um, you know, what a good lead is or lifetime customer value. I think you've got uh, a great story on the opposite, maybe on a very positive uh, perspective. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I just want to give a shout out first to... Um, to Genesis of Atlanta and the the Ellis family, um, I was in the market for a new car. Um, the G- the Genesis GV seventies, I mean, gorgeous. I mean, ten out of ten car and driver. Just I'll go into that stuff, but man, oh man. So um, got hooked up with these guys. Sam and Shannon were great. They went from it being a lead to a close in four days. That's how wow. effective efficient they were. I'm sure it doesn't happen like that all the time, but I didn't even see the car and I'd already bought it. I'd already committed to it. We'd worked out all the stuff. They gave me the right value for my car that I wanted. I got into the car, brand new dealership, the car sitting in its own solarium with a bow on it, with the light reflecting off nice. of it. Like done. Like you were 16 all over again. Done the right way. Yes, yes, except sans weird sexual escapades. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. But but yes, it was, uh, it was taken care of. It was an awesome experience and uh, um, the car is amazing. If you don't know anything about Genesis, um, they are the value proposition is just insane. What you are getting for the value of that car, I mean, it feels like I'm walking in a hundred thousand dollar car. It's fast when I need it to be. It's a tour when I need it to be. The technology is crazy, and then there's these little creature comfort things that are just amazing. So it was an amazing experience. Um, again, shout out to Sam and Shannon. Shout out to Genesis of Atlanta and the Ellis family. Um, it was it was an experience that I would recommend to people now, and that that's always the best kind of sales and the best kind of lead and the best kind of marketing. Well, and they understand the brand, they understand their customer base and who they're targeting. And I think that's a, a great uh, example of, you know, Genesis come out of nowhere. And, and um, you know, God, a couple weeks ago on social media, there was uh, some discussion going back and forth about, um, 
you know, one of their former compet I don't even call him a competitor anymore, is Infinity. Yeah. And how that brand has really, no one knows what it is anymore. Yep. You used to know what it yep. was. And, 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 and it's ironically, really, ironically, uh, the FX Infinity was that first really I had cool it. looking thing. Okay. I had the that's 35. That's what this car is. It's have, the same yeah. body shape. Yeah. So Infinity had it at their fingertips and they let it slide to go more mainstream. And Infinity's biggest problem, and I don't know how he went on this tangent, yeah. is the difference between a fully loaded Nissan and an infin- entry level infinity is almost nothing and that is yeah. very hard when you're playing that game That's Acura all- and Honda have done a much better job and Acura you know in performance modes racing what's the difference between an infinity and Nissan you can't even tell me which makes it really hard to stand yeah. out in a crowded it, segment it wasn't on our list from the survey but that was one of the tenets that we used to always have is what is that brand value you talk about brand uh, value proposition what are the core tenets of the brand what yep. are the certain messaging and every one of our brands because we did have different tiers yep and we, we made sure that those messages did not get too close. Yep. Yep. Right? And that's, when you're competing with yourself, it's a good thing to some point, right? Because you're yeah. weeding out the competition. But if you're cannibalizing your own sales, then it's counterintuitive. It doesn't help anybody. Right. And, yeah. you know, another one for another day is, so that's the first part. And then the second part is having a price continuum. Yeah. So really understand where your pricing is between different tiers. And I've seen it where they got too close which is what I think you're describing with Nissan and Infiniti. And then I've also seen it where a more commodity-driven market, they're not commodities, but people worry about um, raising prices on the lower-end products. So they don't, and they raise them on their more valued products. Then all of a sudden you have too big of a gap, right. and no one is willing to take right. that step up. Now, wait right. a second. It's not worth 30% right. more. Right, and it's too but hard. But they might be worth... 12 to 15 percent and it's more. too hard to just create a middle right yeah. that would be the natural section have the top, yeah. top one go up have the down one go down yeah. and then shoot one right in the middle but creating a brand new brand line is not as easy as people think it no, is oh it's that's a huge investment so all right well we we got uh, we got our tangent we got our tangent always, out of the way we got our tangent but, out of the uh, way number two was budget so yes. uh let's kind of go into that give you any feedback or comments <sighs> or well just, uh, this is the one that I think on this show we've talked about the most, and that's the demise of the CMO and then the power that has been taken away from the CMO. And I think you still have too many people that look at marketing as an expense as opposed to the investment. And while as someone who runs his own businesses and, and is so in run, about running this company's business, I understand the need to pull back and to cut expenses and to watch these things. However, as a marketer, if you don't have a commitment to a, a certain sufficient budget, one that you know you can maintain, you're pretty much digging your own grave in the marketing world. It's just impossible. You, now, look, cutting back 10% is not what we're talking about here. But we're going from, hey, you got 100000 for the rest of the year. And like, just kidding, now you got 5000 for the rest of the year. And that you just can't market with that. Well, n- number one is flexibility. Uh, number two is, you know, the, I guess, well, even number one before that is having a strategic plan. So it all makes sense. You know, but the days, and I used to hear it, um, you know, funny stories about you walk in uh, to a business in mid-January and they go, well, you know, our budget's already committed for the year. Well, those days are gone. If if, if someone says that, then you, you already have a problem that yeah. they're locking themselves in, whether it's advertising or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You know, or they don't you, see you the value in what you're selling. Exactly. So one, one, you have to maintain flexibility. You have to be able to do things. And then, you know, that consistency. We say it, you know, there are times where, yeah, you got to look at, all right, maybe I need to pull back here. But pulling back means, you know, I've got multi layers of campaigns going. And instead of having five or six in the third quarter, maybe I pull back to two or three. Yeah. But you don't stop. Yeah. And That's especially with 10%. Especially in an economic downturn, most partners should be willing to work with you to help you cut that 10%. When you're yeah. talking 30, 40, they're not helping you cut 30, 40%. 10%, most businesses yeah. will have 10% of wiggle room in anything, especially when they're feeling the burn just like you in an economic downturn. Yeah. But when you're talking like, hey, I need to cut 30, why are they incentivized to help you? Right? Yeah. The good ones will say, no, man, sorry, the inventories can be used somewhere else. I'm not, we're not, we're not playing this game. Um, and if it is someone who's going to just sit there and cut their rates by 30, 40%, why didn't they in the first place? with yeah. the marketing. So um, I, I think that one kind of speaks for itself, but I think that the role of marketers is to establish your value early. Yeah. And I was listening back to the episode we did with Jeff Perkins, and he talked about this a lot, is to get those quick wins so you get the long leash so that you can run campaigns that you know have proven to be effective over time. Well, and the other thing is be creative. So let's say you're asked to cut it back. Well, can you be creative? At times I've used product, 
All right. So I, I, I I'm sorry, I don't have twenty five thousand dollars to give you for this sure. show. But what if I provide product for the show? What if I provide product for you know something else that you're doing? Yep. Um, you know, we God, we did a NASCAR thing once where we provided product for essentially a um, you know a, a customer use area, sure. a racetrack, right? And then we got you know we got the um, sponsorship mutually agreed upon value to both sides. And I think if you're having those conversations, don't expect it. Because right. a lot of times you may think your product is a value, but it's really, and I deal with this every day, yeah. where someone's like, let me tell you the value of what you're doing. Well, let me tell you the value. Zero. It's yep. worth nothing. And let me tell you why, just to be polite. It probably doesn't come across right. as polite, but but um, yeah. And, and I think that segues uh, into the next one, because we're just talking about the yep. CMO, and that's the over-reliance or misuse of data. Oh, yeah. And the, 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 the number one reason why I think marketers are being negatively uh, impacted in this current state is because they lost that that instinct. They're not allowed to operate on instinct and creativity, and they're forced to rely on these data and these metrics. And I think w- if you were an early adopter and to they data, don't get out of the office. Well, <laughs> if you were an early adopter, <laughs> if you were an early adopter to data, man, you succeeded. You blew yeah. the doors off. However, now if everybody's playing the same game, how much advantage do you really think you have? If everyone's, it was a perfect example. Moneyball. Oakland oh. Athletics. When it was only them, great, fantastic. Now everybody's playing it, which has leveled the playing field, which means it's not as important for you to use it. So it's going back now to that snicker type manager who's like, he's got to have a feel for the game. He's got to be used as instinct. So I think business is following that same trend. And if you are become too over reliant, one, you get lost in the data. Two, if you're in the office and you're not leaving, you're not seeing what the customer's seeing, how do you have any clue what's going on? Um, but three, I think the data sets, now it's just, Companies are offering tools that you don't need, that you feel like you need because you need to renew levels of data. How much data can there really be? You're selling a product for a certain amount of money to a certain subset of people, right? How, that's it. What more do you need than that? No, it, and it's, you know, when we had the, the big show earlier this year here in Atlanta, you know, we brought one of the more junior marketers down for the show. She learned more in three days. You know, then she would have looking at data for the next three months or more. Yeah. You know, and it's I'm just a huge believer in that. You've got to get your marketing teams out a little bit. You know, it's not just read what's on the Internet. It's not, you know, go through the pile of data, um, look at the pretty charts, Tableau, you you name it. Um, It's getting out and seeing how things really happen. Yeah. uh, From time to time. And so. Um, you've got to have that perspective and you have to understand. And then you also have to, you know, know where to take that anecdotal data and where do I have enough of it and not take the first, we were, we were talking this morning, um, you know, we've switched people from an old PDF newsletter platform now to a live, um, you know, online platform. And so we're starting to get feedback, and there's good feedback, you know, what could be better, but we have to be careful that let's don't just jump immediately at the first thing somebody says. How many times do we hear it? So let's let's dig in, ask questions, and find out a little bit more. We're very open to make changes, um, but you've got to get enough of those real questions out there to, to see how people are interacting with your product, service, online yeah. platform, et cetera. Yeah, and you know, anecdote, I can't tell if the tide is turning against digital or because we have been doing our own digital marketing, I have so immersed in it that I've just learned how to counter it better. Does that yeah. make sense? Like we look, we I've sat here and we've implemented multiple first party, zero party data advertising campaigns across tens of millions of people that I have all filtering down to me through me, right? So that was my crash course in learning digital marketing. How many digital marketers do you think have really gone through something like that? Very, very few having to deal with intellectual property of something as big as the Braves and like international audiences. I don't think many people are going through that. So all of a sudden through that crash course, you quickly learn who who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. And in my humble (laughs) experience, not a lot of people know what they're talking about. They know those vanity metrics and they know the numbers to impress the C-suite, but they know nothing more than that. Yeah. And, and when it changes, are they able to react quick enough is what, I, is what I'm seeing out there. So yeah. I, I think getting out there and asking seeing, a couple of deep questions about the data that someone throws out to see how much they know what's behind the data. Yeah, and I don't even think they need to be deep questions. I think yeah. they need to be borderline questions to see what the response is. Where did you get your data set from? You'd be shocked yeah. how many people that throws off. How are you telling me this story if you don't even know where the data set come from? How are you? How yeah. am I, as the marketing tool, 
being differentiated and delineated from the other marketing tools within this data set. Because if I'm not, then you're just saying your overall marketing doesn't work, which means you are bad at your job. That has nothing to do with me. Yeah. All right. So we got you the know, rant what, out of the what, way. What, what we got are, the rant out of the way too. What are you know? Great question. What's the implication for sales of this data? Yeah. And if they can't answer that. Yeah, because you know what else? I run a sales department, so I could prime pretty quickly if it's really helping sales or not. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 look, uh, this is not don't use data. Like that's one yeah. thing I'll oh, say. Please. Yeah. Data no. is is part of the puzzle. You can learn things that you've never learned. It will prove you wrong so many times. I've talked this story yeah. before about salons and fast food. You'd never think that would fit our audience. It's showed up for now for seven years. Man, they're eating burgers in their cars. Let's just call it what it yeah. is. They're going to get their heads massaged when they get their haircuts. We know what it is. I'm not going to fight that anymore. Okay. Is Taco Bell going to buy us? Probably not. It's probably no. just not going to happen. But do I know that they're eating fast food? I absolutely know that now. Yep. So don't fight the data. It is really, especially the longer it goes, sometimes you got to tweak your proposal, your, your pitch around it. But but um, it is not the end-all, be-all. It will never be the end-all, be-all. And those guys with the tenure and the experience. Now, that's also another segue. We didn't put this in there, but what about marketing executives? and staff. I know staffing is an issue everywhere. I'm sure there are oh. plenty of people out there that are having a really hard time staffing it. And then that brings up, do you do your marketing team in-house? Do you go to an agency? Where do you put what? And I think that issue is going to only get more convoluted and complicated over the next couple of years. Well, I think here, here's one that I see, and, and granted, I'm, I'm old, um, but I see it a lot with a lot of seen, seasoned uh, marketing leaders who have done many many different things. And what often happens is businesses say, well, we only need one CMO. But there's an opportunity to bring in people that, you know, maybe it is a little um, higher level than, um, you know, your manager, but maybe it's a, a chance to bring people who have gone through these type of experiences, understand data and yep. the markets. Yep. Um, and bring them in in a role that can help train and mentor and guide, you know, the junior teams. And I think, to me, you know, right now, that's where I see a lot of companies could be um, really having a huge win. And maybe it, maybe it is twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars more than you know some data, you know, analyst. But what do you get for that? Yeah. What's the ROI yeah. versus having one more data analyst versus having yeah. someone who can understand and strategize and move your team forward? Yeah. I, I think it's similar, though, to hiring salespeople yeah. in which marketers' job is to tell a really good story. And they are really good at telling stories. So yeah. that doesn't mean they've been through the ringer and they've seen the experiences. It just means they know how to tell their story. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of that disconnect is, is I've met these guys that were, you know, I saw, I ran into a guy the other day who was very high up in car dealership and marketing, and now he's selling effective TV for Comcast. And it's like, wow. man, that is a, that is an interesting kind of fall. Um, but when you think about it, who, what, was he that good? I don't know. I, was, I, I wasn't in this industry sure. for very long to know if he was good. I just know that cream does always rise to the top. top. And if you really are that guy that is always or girl that is always adding insights in the right moments with because of the right instincts, you will always have a career for yourself. And again, maybe yeah. it's sales. Maybe it's not marketing. Maybe but, it's not. But there have been, look, we, we've, we're seeing it again, a lot of the uh, restructurings. And so when you see the restructurings, it tends to more often than not, hit, let's say, the 40 to 60 euro crowd, right? The mid executives and things like that. So yeah. is there an opportunity for, you know, looking at your your new hires a little differently? You know, what, what can set you apart? What can, you know, again, do I need a team of eight, you know, great MBA data analyst or do I need a team of six of those right. with one Lead. Maybe just one person, you know, Literally. not two, yeah. that can help maximize and get the most out of them. Yeah. Again, anecdotal, but I have been seeing a lot of coverage in the press as of late of the defense of middle management. Yeah. And I do believe that in the next several years, all companies will be more rewarding towards loyal people and more towards loyalty because yeah. well, it's, gotten out of, it's gotten out of control. I mean, my younger brother, the guy that was doing meta, you know, social media for meta, he's bounced jobs six times in, in eight years. And good for him. He's got him a ton of career. But I looked at him and I go, dude, you got to stop. Stop. I go, right. there's going to be a point where that tide is going to turn and your explanation of why you were bouncing is not going to cut it. And if you want to make it to that next level where you're the guy hiring, you cannot be bouncing around so much. You hire a 50 plus year old that has gone through restructuring and struggled a little bit because of perceived biases. Um, more than more often than not, they're going to be incredibly loyal. 
right. to their next Especially spot. if you pulled them out of that. Yes, right. I agree. But I mean, so. it's, it's, it's so hard to find that, and I'm not trying to simplify yeah. it. Point is, is that I think staffing, especially in something that is a soft science like marketing, will get harder. And I think the agencies are having that same problem. And, oh, and when absolutely. the agencies are having that problem, what do they do? They cut expenses. They ship things overseas. They still like charging you the same amount of money. Yeah. But that is another big issue I'm but seeing right now. they cut people, too. I mean, oh, no, they cut to, everybody. So, yeah. And they're trying to farm this in the Philippines. And they're, and they're keeping their prices the same. Yeah. They're, they're making my brother go back okay. to his office because they're paying for it. All right. So one, this one is a segue into one of the questions was one size fits all. So if you are having to cut your budgets... Do not go the route of one size fits all. All right. So I've seen, you know, at times where we go, okay, well, maybe we'll just combine these campaigns or we'll combine these audiences and therefore we don't have to duplicate or have three different campaigns going. Stop. Yeah. I mean, if you get to that mass view, it better be a true mass audience that you're that you're trying to get to. Yeah, I, I do think that that is, a, um, that is a method of the marketing tools that they've become so single focused that, you know, you're, if you're doing radio, it's just radio commercials and they're not, they try to do digital, but they're only good at one thing, yeah. which means you really got to be across. When you meet that provider that can do all those things for you, spend the time with them because if they can make your life easy and diversify what you're doing, right. it's not just about radio. It's how is social media helping here? How are your events playing in? What's the loyalty? If you can put all those things together, you got to start asking those questions more because if so, then you'll realize what's different about people. And again, approaching your radio company the same way as you do your print company, the same way you do your digital company, the same way you do your social media influencers uh, is going to land you really quickly in the wrong place. And just how you deal with the you know, an influencer, should they be contacted every day? Are you giving them the right copy points? Just it, it, if you apply the same principles to those people, it's going to be big trouble for sure. Yeah, no, no question. So uh, another one on here was finding the right tools. Yeah. So this one is another one. As I've made my way into our, you know, executive and, and management suite, man, I get hit up mm -hmm. seven times a day by someone trying to sell me some sort of crazy tool. And I, my response is usually the same, like 4,000% ROI. I'm like, cool. Well, uh, we make $15 million. So you're saying me, you're going to make me $600 million? I go, because the only ROI that matters to me is the money in which I can generate off of this. And I never get a response back. So you, you at least respond. I get about three to five emails a day on lead sources. I, I try to always I just, respond. Man. I'm I in just, the sales uh, game. I try to respond. Uh, I try to get people. And now the problem is, is that it's so automated now well, and I'm st and it, the opposite. They, they acted like we're going to, this AI is going to save the, and you'll never know it's automated. It has gotten so obvious what is automated and what is not. And if it's automated, I will never even humor with a response. Yeah. Okay. If it is, it is Nick Constino, 6 of the Flan slash Braves Network because it pulls it right from LinkedIn. And that's <laughs> another tip, actually. You want to screw with these yeah. people? On your LinkedIn, put something in there that is blatantly a computer sure. won't realize it and yeah. see how quickly that you see that showing up in things. Yeah. Like And like you put Nick instead of just a – you make it a – you know, there's probably a K somewhere in a different right. alphabet. Use that and watch how quickly that shows up. That's a good way to trick that system. Yeah. But that, that's what's frustrating. Those And it's automated and it's just like, maybe you didn't hear me the first time or just blah, 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 blah. And I get it. I really do. But if you're not putting a personal touch on what you have to offer, you are never going to succeed and you're, you're part of the commodity. You are the commodity. Yeah. No, it's um, I said, I just I, I've kind of got to the point of nah. if I have a need, I'll respond to people. But most of the time it is so um, it's just blatant. And then I get, you get the second one and then you get the third one and one last chance. Uh, whatever. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, people who are relying on those type of list. That's the other thing that kind of gets me is, you know, they're trying to sell leads and yet they're. They're pulling a list that they've got really no idea why they're pulling yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, LinkedIn, they're making money, Microsoft. I like it as a tool, so I understand, but the in mails, I mean, it, it, it's five or six a day of an yeah. in mail, someone trying to offer me, selling me leads. They're going to get qualified leads and qualified meetings for you. Well, first of all, how do you have 500 companies doing the same thing? Yeah. What people are taking these meetings? Like, are you paying the people to take the meetings? Is it the lowest level executive that just wants to talk to somebody? Why in God's earth would I answer a call of a meeting service that's trying to generate a meeting with me? Would you yeah. ever to answer that? No. And how much, how much, at one point, how much budget were you controlling when you were at oh, the paper I'm, companies? Oh, well, I mean, okay, it's 18 million. Okay, so you're the person that exactly everyone's going after, yeah. and, you, and there's no chance you would ever answer yeah. those emails. So what is yeah. it? What is, who's being tricked? 
How yeah. are we allowing this trickery to happen? I don't get yeah. it. And eventually, the market will collapse on itself. We know that. Yeah. But for right now, where is the money being generated? I have no idea. Yeah. Which brings us to marketing tools. There's a new tool every day. Is it AI? Is it, are you using um, automation? So that marketing automation is happening. What are these tools? How much are you committing to? What percentage yeah. of your sales? If you're spending 30% of your marketing budgets on tools, well, that's 30% that you can't spend on marketing. Are you paying an agency 15%? Are they worth the 15%? Mm -hmm. If not, no radio station, no TV station, no company is just going to give you an extra 15% of value. It's it's going to disappear from somewhere. So what are you doing? What are you doing with those tools? Yeah, no, I think it's fascinating. You know, when we come back, we'll uh, let's dive in a little bit more to the tools. Yep. We'll, uh, we'll talk about chat GBT as well as part of that. But, um, you know, I think it's... Uh, and I think that's a, a problem out there is there are some marketing leaders who think the tools will solve, you know, the problem. And that's probably the biggest thing that uh, is, is, I think, the failure. It's understand your process, understand what you're doing. Yeah. The tools themselves are not going to uh, always solve your problem. So uh, we'll dig into that. And you've been listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. We'll be right back. This morning in the Atlanta airport, no one's missing a meal on Mac Wilburn's watch. With 11 restaurants to serve passengers, he's got dining for every destination. And it all started when Mac talked with First Horizon Bank about opening a franchise in the airport. Now it's open for business and cleared for takeoff. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Trip Job and Nick Constantino here. You know, we were just talking a little bit about um, tools. All right. And I think that, um, you know, my, my a little bit of my rant was, you know, people that think, oh, this new tool is going to solve our marketing dilemma. Right. And it's not the tools. The tools can help. Yeah. But do you understand your plan? Do you, do you have a process? And that is the core part. Now, can you automate? Can you find better data, dive in? Whatever those tools may be, um, I think that's where they can help you. Yeah. But um, the tools themselves aren't going to solve the problem. I mean, ChatGBT is no. not going to solve a problem. No. Can no. it Can it come up with greater ideas and, and faster for you to think through thought leadership? Absolutely. Uh, but remember when we had our 100th show and yep. uh, I thought more is – a uh, quote was where she got had chat GBT do the quote. Just, just rambling. Like, yeah. You know, I, I will say it is somewhat flattering if you look for the marketing madman. So on my Google, I have generative AI on. So Bard is doing some stuff. And yeah. man, for, for a show really that, you know, is, is a little show we're doing in Atlanta. There is a lot of information that it's compiling to wow. tell a story about us. And I was like, damn, man, good. Yeah. If the robots rise up, at least they'll know who the hell I am. <laughs> uh, you know, I think a lot of this is a, is a function of COVID where people were working from home, so they needed new tools to, to make their, their tasks more efficient, which caused a lot of this stuff, right? So, you know, again, marketing automation, if done right. Marketing automation, if the inputs are correct, is creating eases and outputs. However, first of all, your entire staff has to adopt it. Yeah. And have you seen how marketers, the ADD involved in marketing? Obviously, you've listened to this show, so you have. But, like, it, it's just you need people. We have our own CRM systems here. I, they're 60-year-old guys. You think they're going to start using CRM yeah. out of nowhere? No freaking chance they're using CRM. So it, the systems are only as good as the policies and how you implement them. That's the first exactly. problem. The second problem is, is that we are so focused, again, on outputs. No one's thinking of the inputs. What's the oh. data you're putting in there? What it, Do you know your average sale per customer? Do you know the zip codes, the geo? That's all it's processing. It's processing the data in which you put in. It can't scour anywhere to find that. It's processing it and putting outputs. And if you have good inputs, you will get good outputs. Unfortunately, most companies, most marketing staffs, most agencies do not have good inputs. Because yeah. this is what they're doing. Here are the past 50 successful campaigns we've done over 10 years. Give us a new campaign. Well, you think ChatGPT knows the, the tastes of people that have changed? Do you think oh. they know any of these things? I'm reading right now for the first time ever. It's over. Tipping's done. These kids are not tipping. They don't yeah. think that it's a value. And you know what the greatest day of my life would be? When I don't have to tip anymore. Because I'm Europe. always a sucker. And, and Europe does it, but here's the thing. Europe, everything's more expensive. Right. So there, there's going to be a give and take. But I, I worked, I bartended in Italy when I was 
20 years old, okay? I was tipped two things, okay? One was a lovely bottle of wine from a family estate. Two, I was pretty much offered a 17-year-old daughter. Like, those were the tips <laughs> I was offered by the regulars. Like, just take her out. And I'm like, okay, that was it. No cash, yeah, nothing, nothing else. else. That's what I was offered yeah. as bartending in Florence, Italy. Um, so oh, that's a whole. Uh, we could get into the whole tipping thing and uh, f- you know convenience and everything well, else. But again, it's, it's just, just trends right change. Be... The point is trends change. ChatGPT yeah. doesn't know what trends change over. Yeah. They might know what's written in an encyclopedia, or oh, they don't make those anymore in a history book. Yeah. But they're not going to know what's really changing. The last one is just right now. Marketing is so crowded. Yeah. There are messages everywhere. You are being bombarded. If you do not bake in a little bit of risk to what you do you are in big trouble. You have to take risks. I'm not saying no. be the first to adopt. I'm not saying you gotta be the first person on TikTok. I gotta be the first person on Chat BGB, But You don't have to change your brand name to X. Oh, you know what? But, Honestly, but, I'm officially taking a statement here. I'm done with Musk. I'm over yeah, all of it. You take I'm, that one. Well, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm, I'm done. done with him too, but I will say this. I think there's a lot of things that are against the, bo- the book that he did, but the amount of press and um, eyeballs that will come on because he made this huge radical view and a lot of people, which I do agree, it, it was done from, I think, a personal standpoint, his way to rip the Band-Aid off and throw a lot of things back in, in the employee's face. And throw think, $20 billion I, dollars in market value out the window. Exactly, yeah. But he is going to get, there is going to be so much interaction around that. I mean, Twitter had kind of you know dropped back down the last yeah. few months. So. I do think he is he is going to get the initial rise. The question will be, by 2024, will X be relevant anymore? So um, that was a huge risk. No one's, you know, you, you have to be worth gagillions to be able to do those type of things. Um, again, I, I don't think it's going to be successful because I don't think he has enough employees left to really drive a meaningful value with the no. company. No, not, right? not not leader, not thought leader employees. He's driven yeah. them all out. Right, and so I think that's the problem. And the brand brand will never solve that. Yeah, right. That that's a different issue. So uh, I think he'll get the exposure he wants. Yeah, but I think there's other underpinnings that are going to be his problem. But yes, that that's. Uh, you do need to stand out from the crowd. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing right now in a lot of places is more and more people want to be back congregating, be in person, meetings, conferences, um, ways to, you know, have that, um, you know, look, I'm, I talk to people all the time on Teams, but I'm offering the ones that are here to have, you know, a coffee meeting or, now, or is whatever. That, the question, though, is that a trend? Or is that just making up the difference for when it wasn't able to happen for the previous three years? And that's what I think people are having a really hard time delineating. Because yes. I'll tell you right now, Live Nation is doing you know eight concerts for twenty bucks again, which means the demand is not okay. there right now. Because okay, I'm they more over- on the B two B side. But on so anything, right. but on but anything no, right. though, on yep. anything is a matter of the, the because you couldn't do it for so long, you desperately want to do it again. Is that a trend or is that a? I think it's understanding for- the saturation of the market. So here's my view on, and I've seen a lot of concerts this year. Um, we made a decision not to go to one this week because of the cost, and it was like, well, you know, we could go do sure. other things. I can see someone for free sure. at a at a restaurant, um, and so I think right now on the entertainment side, I think it is so saturated. Everyone is back. Everyone's got their last concert. I think that's you know going back to, um, well, you may have to do it, but are you going against the trends? I think my example in conferences and face-to-face business meetings, I think people are looking for that again. I think people are tired of being on Teams all the time. They have a uh, civilized conversation over coffee or whatever and and get to know the person. I think that's an opportunity that is real again. Yeah. Um, Because we've not had – we had oversaturation of Zoom and Teams and things like that. So that is going against the trend, whereas the concert one is a great one. I just think – Right now, this year, we've oversaturated on the entertainment side. I also I think there's so many award shows and so many different oh, marketing yeah. organizations that there's we've gotten too much, that people are pulled in too many directions. Again, I get to ask to speak at all this stuff. Yeah. And I, I have to ask, how many people there? What's the purpose of this? Because they're trying to do too much. And I get it. I want everyone to connect. I've, the best relationships in my life have never been done via Zoom. It's impossible. Yep. But I'm just saying that if 
if we're putting all this time and effort into these trends and all of a sudden it collapses and it just regresses to the mean, then that's a lot of wasted effort and energy. So ironically, Trip, I just received an email from a yeah. Jordan Rouse saying, growing your revenue, all in lower cases. Yeah. So here's a great example. Hi, Nick, saw you offer SEO services. We don't. <laughs> As you are looking to close more leads at your agency, are you looking to close more leads at your agency? We're not. No, one. No, no. Okay, those are the first two sentences of a, something that slipped through my spam filters that came to my email. So yeah. there's your example. None of those things are even remotely. Yeah, accurate. you don't do any. Guess what? You got a tool. It spit out. Here's your 20 uh, emails to put out today, and there's no research done behind it. Yeah, well, that it literally just happened as I was yeah. as, as we were doing well, the show. That so. is a great way to end. What's wrong with marketing in 2023? So. Um, hopefully, I think it's good discussions. I think uh, step back and think. I mean, that's really what it is. Ask step people, back and ask think. Ask people. It's different paying somebody $150 an hour to really give you an, an outside point of view. You don't need to pay an agency full time to do that. Yeah. Step out and think. Talk to people. Yeah. And if it doesn't make sense, guess what? It probably doesn't make sense, right? So stop and, and quit doing it. So uh, fun as always, Nick. Um, look forward to uh, next week's show. And you have been listening to The Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation. Like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC.